months. I'm going to say thank you for that. I wasn't expecting that. I totally forgot, actually, this morning that what tomorrow is to be in chaos this morning. Also, I'm going to take this moment to thank the congregation and every member of the congregation on behalf of myself and on behalf of Pastor Sean for the great uh, outpouring of love that you gave us. Uh, we firmly appreciate it, fully appreciate generosity. Thank you very much for that. I believe I've covered all the announcements. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we celebrate today, we celebrate the coming of your Son to the world and all he and you gave for us, who frankly didn't deserve to be in many ways. You paid for our sins, you brought us to your bosom, and we can't be thankful enough. We always have to remember the reason that we have the celebration every year. We also have a lot of family celebrations, the fun that we're going to have. We ask you to give blessings to the service and the service tonight that we can sing with joyous voices. And we remember all those who are sick and missing loved ones. It can be a, a time of trials, too, and uh, there's a lot of stresses to go with our business and our lives. But we just ask you to give you your peace, Lord, and uh, to remind us that you bring peace to all men who go. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. And Merry Christmas to you all. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Pastor, again, happy birthday. We won't ask how old are you. We will assume. <laughs> But we know, you look good. <laughs> still walking and still doing all the things that a young man would do. Amen? Amen. All right, let us sing. And our first hymn is hymn 183. And we are going to take our hymnals and we are going to stand and we are going to sing. And the title of that song is Good Christian Men Rejoice. Thank you. 
have a perfect record this month. I haven't forgot about doing the memory verse. <laughs> and this week, we've even got Emma back to remind me, usually. <laughs> She's the one that has to look at me and go, okay, my memory may be improving. Our memory verse, 2 John 6, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment. Just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. 2 John 6. Reading of the word of the Lord. Please be seated. This morning, um, I don't have any prayer requests that have been, have been brought up. We do have some that are kind of recurring. Number one is Evan. We have been praying for Evan for quite some time. Uh, I have not received any updates since his surgery, except that he had survived the surgery. I don't. Emma, do you have any? Anything uh, yeah, else? he's still in a coma. He's still in the coma. Um, they, they're doing another benefit mid January and quickly part um, for his family. Okay. Uh, a benefit for Evan, if you're not familiar with what's going on there, see me later. I'll explain that to you. But another benefit for him coming up. I did see something about that on Facebook. Uh, social media, no doubt has it. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the additional, let's see, Linda, <laughs> uh, I remembered. Oh, okay, good. That's what I was going to mention, but yes, please continue to pray for Linda. I haven't heard anything more, so I am assuming that progress is slow but steady. Um, the other thing is, John and Ann Holford are on their way to New Hampshire this morning to finally see their granddaughter. So, prayers for Sue. Okay. Also, I'm assuming, Bob, that Betty made it to Florida. Okay, I didn't get any 911 calls on that. So. She said, said maybe she'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Probably depends on the weather, right? <laughs> Uh, whether or not our weather is better than no. Okay, I think that's all I have for prayer requests. John, okay, Gary, I'm sorry. Yeah, Gary is uh, home, finally from the hospital. He's on uh, comfort care and hospice. And uh, he's trying to stay as comfortable as possible. Gary is Rhonda's brother. Um, this has been a saga. He was in the hospital for 17 days. So getting him home yesterday or the day before is a pretty big event. So let's... Bill. Yep, yep. I think it, yep. That would appreciate your prayer for a long time. Uh, congregation member Cranesville. Uh, Bruce Knudsen is back in St. Peter's Hospital. He's been battling cancer. That's all I know. We'll do that. All right. Let's go to prayer. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for bringing us together. We know that the season brings a level of great joy. And it is indeed that day we celebrate now and tonight and even tomorrow as we gather. And yes, we celebrate great joy. But with all the busyness of the season, there tends to be chaos in our lives. Sometimes the chaos even extends to our church services, as was witnessed this morning. Father, calm our hearts as we are before you this morning. Let us worship you. Just clear our hearts, clear our hands. Let our service be a glory and honor to you as our music has already been. This morning we have a handful of people we bring before you. This gentleman from Cranesville who is battling cancer again. We pray that you be with him. Give him strength for the battle. <coughs> give him uh, good care. Give the doctors, all of the medical team around him, great skill and great wisdom in what they do there. And uh, we just ask that he comes out of this the other side uh, full and strong. We ask you to be with Gary. We ask you to be with John and Rhonda. We ask you to be all those who tend him at this point in his life, the end of his time, whatever that is, if it's days or weeks. We pray, Lord, that you will give him grace, comfort, and peace. And also, as they say, strength for all the family and support. <coughs> Father, thank you that Betty got safely down to Florida. We pray that you give her a great time there with her son. And anyone else she gets a chance to enjoy while she's there. And we pray that you get her back safely when she does come. 
pray that you continue to be with Linda. We thank you that she's home after more days in the hospital than I care to think of. And I pray that you will strengthen her to continue to build her up and just be very real to her in the days ahead. And Father, as we go before you now, the portion of our service where we return to you some of what you have given to us. You have given us, first of all, the greatest of all gifts, your son Jesus Christ, who brought us salvation. But you've blessed us in many other ways. And as we seek to honor that and return a portion of that to you, we pray that you will be honored in the gift and uh, in the act of the giving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
song. Actually, two songs. <laughs> two songs we'll be doing, and it's one is found in M one ninety four, and the other is one ninety two. The first one is O Holy Night, and the second one will be R the Earl the Angels Sing. So right now we should just take our hymn books, rise up, and we will be singing.
a few pages back, M 192, remain standing, please. Heart, the arrow, the angel sing. <laughs>
I'd like to ask you to join me in stand and reading, honor and reading of God's word. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to his fathers, to, I'm sorry, to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. The reading of God's word. Please be seated. And join me as I pray. <coughs> our Father, as we look at this segment. We're in awe of the organizational mindset of this young woman. You chose to serve, to bear your son, to bring him to earth. And we look at all she said, and this morning as we take it apart to some degree, we ask you to use everything she said in our own hearts and lives so that we can better serve and honor you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A full examination of this would require that we go back to the Old Testament, we go back to 1 Samuel, read 1 Samuel 2, which is a prayer of another young woman, Hannah, and we can find all kinds of interesting parallels there. Uh, we're not going to do that this morning. It would take hours. We will not take apart every little bit that is here. Uh, we're only going to look at a few things, and just a couple of cautions first of all. If you run in, in the segments of society, or you had experience in segments of society where you have a lot of radicals and revolutionaries. When Peggy and I went to college, we had a guy that thought Jesus was a real revolutionary. Okay? That, that thought still exists, and this text is one that is often used as a revolutionary text. That's bogus. It's an absolute piece of violence to the text. It's not what it says. And then there's the other thing with this text. Some use it as a self-aggrandizing text, or they think it's a self-aggrandizing text. <laughs> Mary is singing about herself and how great she is. And there is a segment of society, and it's no secret, it's not, we're not hiding anything here, among our Roman Catholic friends, and yes, they are our friends, among our Roman Catholic friends, they have taken what Mary said, they've added it to what the angel said, they've added it to what Elizabeth said under the power of the Holy Spirit, and they have come out with this doctrine of veneration of Mary. And it's, again, it's an absolute abuse of the text. And we're not going to do anything with that except explain it a little bit this morning. This is the time of year when what's one of the songs we hear played on the radio? If you're listening to most radio stations, what's one of the most gorgeous songs of this time of year? Mary, you know. Ave Maria. It's beautiful. The problem is, how many people here know Latin? Yeah, yeah, how much of it? Come on, like I do. Yeah, that much. Diane, maybe a little bit more. If David were here, maybe a little bit more than that. Okay, it means Hail Mary. That's the beginning of the rosary. And actually, Ave Maria is a little more than the musical version of the rosary. And hearing the rosary, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is the rosary makes Mary a co-redemptrix with Jesus Christ, okay? And that's a problem, because it says, pray for us sinners. No, there's no biblical warrant for anyone but Jesus to intercede for us. You don't pray to saints, you don't pray to Mary. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Mary was indeed special, but only because God chose her for a specific task. 
not for any reason of her own worth, nothing around her birth, nothing of that. It was only because God chose her. And now she sings this great hymn. It's a hymn of joy. It's a hymn of praise. It's a hymn that in any facet of it gives all glory and all praise to God. So as we poke through this this morning, we're going to look at three elements of it. We're going to look at statements about herself. We're going to look at statements about God's character. And we're going to include actions with his character. And then we're going to see what she said about God's promises. At least one major promise. First statements about herself. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord. First up, he is worthy of worship. I've used the expression different times in recent weeks that when we talk about worship, we're talking about assigning value to God. And that's what Mary did. Mary was assigning value to God. Her spirit rejoiced in God, her Savior. She recognized that salvation was of God. Purely, simply, totally, it's within the power and the purview of the Almighty God. This has always been the truth. God always has provided salvation. It's best expressed to us, maybe. Maybe there's other pieces of scripture that would do it as well. But I like this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. To draw near to God, God will reward that. He provides the means, he provides the methodology, and in the times before Jesus, we may not be fully conversant with exactly how that worked, but we know that people look forward to the redemption that would come from God, seen in his Messiah. They didn't know what it was going to look like, look like Jesus. They didn't know that at the time. The salvation was still in the same means. Uh, he all, she also said in here, her soul magnifies the Lord. And I just wanted to focus on the fact that she talks about soul and then spirit. Her soul is the eternal portion of her being. Her spirit is the innermost part of her physical being. I am what's called a dichotomist. I believe that we exist in body and soul and spirit. The soul and spirit are very closely aligned, but in this particular context its spirit is talking about the innermost being it's just the, the personal being it's just a different thing and I probably shouldn't have brought that up but I did so anyway it's because of his work she goes on to say his work that she's going to be recognized and rightfully so because she has been blessed uh, been blessed for what he has done for her and to her and again, not about how good, how deserving she was. And we need to look at a couple of words out of that verse, verse 48. As we look in verse 48, uh, we will see that it says, uh, All generations will call me blessed. Okay, I'm sorry, first of all, he has looked on his humble estate of his servant, and all generations will call her blessed. That idea of the humble estate. In Greek, that's only one word. I can't pronounce it, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, it's only one, one word, but it has to do with the way she understands herself, her humble estate. She understands what she is, who she is, and acknowledges that. And the humility plays into something we mentioned last week when she said, Behold, you know, let it be to your servant according to your word, your servant. She's humble enough to speak to the angel and say, let it be to your servant according to your word. And, and that's the simplicity of the being of Mary. It's a wonderful thing. The other thing there is the word blessed. Blessed's a word that once in a while you need to look at because it generally carries a certain characteristic in the underlying Greek uh, the word is eulogos, which has to do with good words and the speaking of good words. And I thought, surely that's what I was going to find when I went digging through this. But instead, as I dug through this, I found that it's a different word. It's makarios. And that's the same word that underlies blessed in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure in heart. 
blessed, blessed, blessed. It's this very interesting word that carries with it the thought of happiness. And by a very interesting chain of word evolution, etymology, it goes from the Greek to the Latin to the Spanish to the name of a city and to the name of a dance. The Macarena. Okay. Macarios. When you see the word blessed, it just might have that understanding of happy, joyous, almost reckless abandon in, in the Macarena, which is what that is all about. It's really kind of a decadent song if you've ever made it. Um, but anyway, it's because that God has done great things for her that people are going to say these great things. And because of that, she is happy. And it's not about her, not even from her own perspective. It's God and God alone who made all this happen. And then she changes the thought process a little bit and goes into statements about God's character. And as I said, we blend statements about, about character with statements about action. First note that he is mighty. The word that underlies that, and yes, I'm kind of on a word nerd thing this morning. The word that underlies that is uh, dunatus, uh, dunatos. Dunatos is similar to and related to dunamis, which is the word from which we get dynamite. Okay? Don't get caught up in people that talk about the dynamite power of Jesus Christ. Once again, that's a bad piece of preaching. Because dynamite is controlled. Dynamite is a controlled power. It was designed, it was invented to control the explosive and the craziness of TNT. That's what dynamite's all about. It's control. The power of Christ is a control power. He works his power with great control and diligence. And he understands, and she understands, that there is a power within God that is perfectly controlled and working in her. It's not to say his name is holy. There's a reminder in there not to use his name in vain. We go back to the Ten Commandments and we get that. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, we understand it generally and we use it as don't take the name of God as a curse. Because let's face it, the name of God is taken as an expletive. It is used as a filler when nothing else works. You know, throw the name of Jesus Christ out there. Why? That's taking the name in vain. There's also other parts of taking God's name in vain. When you assign to God or to God's word things that he doesn't or it does not say. There are many people that will say, well, God told me that you're supposed to do. There's preachers who say that. I've had preachers tell me that for all practical purposes. They will try to design your life around what they think God is saying. No, just take the word of God. Go to the Word of God, learn from the Word of God, and take it from there. There's various other things I'll talk about a little, a little bit later here, but I want to get spend some time on the idea of His mercy. She talks about His mercy. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. If we go back to the Psalms, there's one Psalm that every other verse, if you look at a King James translation, says, His mercy endureth forever. It's generally translated today as His steadfast love. Steadfast love and mercy are pretty much the same thing. It's undeserved. God gives us His mercy. God gives us His steadfast love. And we don't deserve even a bit of it. Just as Mary recognizes, she deserved none of the goodness that God was giving her. She even sees the generational aspect of it going back through her life. She knows her family history all the way back before David, no doubt. But she knows she's a child of David. And she understands how his mercy played out. And then she moves on to the arm of the Lord, which is an interesting thing. It's an anthropomorphism. It's an idea of assigning human characteristics to God. 
which is kind of tricky. But the way it comes out here, this arm of the Lord, God doesn't have an arm, a physical arm, but he does at times sweep away the enemies. Just like you clear a desk in the trash can. That's about what he's done. We could look at an individual. We, once again, we look at David. He took David from a humble place, shepherding the sheep, took him to a battlefield, had him kill Goliath, the proudest of the proud, of a proud nation, of a proud king. This little shepherd boy. I, one of my favorite Bible stories. Always will be one of my favorite Bible stories. Little red-headed kid. Great big giant. He's all in armor, and he's got his sling. Okay? Who won? David. That's the arm of the Lord. Other places where an entire army fled in fear without the, the Jewish nation ever stepping foot into battle. And they were killing each other, and they left all their plunder, and Israel thrived on, partly on account of that. Once again, a proud army of proud soldiers with a proud king. And a pretty, but at that point in time, a pretty humble people. So God will do that. He will use his great arm to elevate his people and humble the proud. Can we talk about, just a little bit about God's promises. We mentioned a couple weeks ago the servant Israel, God Call the entire nation of Israel his servant, and then he kind of zeroes it down in Isaiah 42 to Jesus. Okay. Uh, the fact that Israel would be a blessing to all nations comes out throughout the Old Testament. You have to trace it. Once I've used the expression before, follow the breadcrumbs, and if you follow the breadcrumbs, you will get to Christ. Follow it all the way from Genesis. I'm not going to go back to the first part of Genesis, but we see the blessing God had promised to his servant in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Ultimately, this was in Abraham's offspring to begin with, but when you look forward, it carries through, it comes forth to Jesus Christ being born. Born of a Jewish mother. Born into a Jewish culture. Brought into the public view as an adult into a Jewish culture. Into Jewish society. John says, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Well, we're celebrating his coming. He was born, raised, and came of age in a Jewish culture. And it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's us. Because when his own people rejected him, and we follow it, and we've been doing the book of Acts on our normal preaching schedule, as we see what happened in the early church, the Jews rejected, the Gentiles believed, and thus we come about as Gentiles dominating the church. So how do we react to her statements? Those of you who know me, this is where I get to my questions. First question, is life all about God or is it all about us? That entire few verses that Mary just laid out in this great hymn of praise, Who's that about? That's about God, not at all about her. So we have to ask ourselves, are we living for God's glory? Does it even come to mind? Does he even come to mind? Most of our day-to-day -day activities, what's the first thing that happens when your feet hit the floor? <laughs> you know, for me, it's coffee, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, Mike says the same thing. Okay, I have a good brother. <laughs> all right. That's really not it. Chances are, before I've been up, before my feet hit the floor, I've already been praying at some level or another. <sighs> but it's really scary. Mary understood what life was all about. And we ask her, 
should ask ourselves this every morning. If you do nothing else from this point on, if the servant does nothing else for you, tomorrow morning when your feet hit the floor, commit it to God's glory. Commit the day to God's glory. Whatever it's going to be, just leave it in his hands. Okay? Second, what is our understanding of God's character? This is where a lot of folks really get tangled up. Because their understanding of God, their understanding of his character, his nature, his attributes, is wrapped up in pop culture. My heart tells me I should do... That's one of the biggest lies you can hear today. My heart says... Well, if your heart disagrees with what Scripture says, guess what? Your heart's wrong. How often do you think that's going to happen? Quite often. All right. Then you get this other one. Uh, God made me this way. I guess he's going to have to live with it. That's about the height of arrogance right there. Uh, one of my favorite. Oh, I think God understands my intentions. Well, I got a news flash for the people to say that. Oh, he does understand your intentions. And your intentions are to do your own thing and not pay attention to his word. That's just a caution for anybody that ever wants to think that way. Another one is getting very popular. Well, a loving God would never send his anybody to hell. Well, they got the entirety of Scripture wrong because, yes, he's a loving God. Absolutely, they got that part of it right. But we go to hell because we are rebellious people. And God gives us an out. And we know that God loved the world. He saved his only spirit. But he sent his only son, Jesus. And we celebrate and we worship Okay. He sent his only son because we are absolute sinners. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And even those of us who have trusted Christ still sin. That's just the reality of it. We still sin. Maybe only little sins, not the big sins we might have once committed, but we still sin. We are still deserving of hell, but the blood of Christ has paid for our sin. And all we need to do is to trust him. And trust him and accept that payment. We need to confess our sins. We'll get to that in just a minute. Because there's another thing that's out there today in pop culture. Well, I don't think the Bible applies on that today. Well, you get that one. I don't think the Bible applies. Well, yeah, the Bible applies. What happens is... People are filtering the Bible through culture as opposed to filtering culture through the Bible. I heard it said recently, a gentleman by the name of Paul Washer, who's a pretty well-known preacher, and I will get the quote wrong because I couldn't get back to it. Anybody else frustrated by social media where you get this much of something and then you can never find it again? Yeah, well, that happened to me the other day. I looked for it for almost an hour. I'll give you the best I can give it to you. There is no problem, or almost no problem, that cannot be solved by appropriate application of God's Word. Now, God's Word is not going to tell you how to fix your carburetor. Right? That's true. But on any topic it addresses, it's all we need. It is all we need for life and godliness. We find that in 2 Peter. Commercial for David's Sunday school class. Come back after the first of the year and we'll get right back into the characteristics of the Christian life. And yeah, the word addresses all that is necessary for life and godliness. Go to God's word. Say, what's happening is people are making God and God's word about us. Trying to make God into the genie in the bottle, so to speak. Finally, what are we doing with his promises? And this is a big one. I'm going to simplify it just to one verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First thing, confess. Agree with God that our actions are sinful. Do not measure up to his standard of holiness, the perfection which, with which he lives, with which he exists. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
two facets of this. One is coming to him initially for salvation. If you're hearing this this morning or hearing it tomorrow or whenever you listen to this online, come to him. Confess your sins. Repent of your sins. Turn and go his way, not your way. And then for the rest of us, when we recognize that we are in sin and we need to be honest with ourselves and honest with God, confess it, repent, and continue the way we were supposed to be going. One of the greatest of the songs that I didn't pay attention, I know it's going to be played some point either today or tonight, may have been played this morning in the prelude. Uh, Yesu, joy of man's desire, holy wisdom, love most bright. Drawn by thee, our souls aspiring, soar to uncreated light. This is what God has done to us. God has brought light into darkness. We're living in a dark world. That's the theme of this evening's message. Light in a dark world. Okay. See, many people understand God. Or, I'm sorry. Many understand God. I'll go that way. Many understand God the way they want to understand God. Mary understood God for who he is. She understood her relationship to him because she knew who he was, who he is, and understood his character and his promises because she understood God. She exalted him. She lived for him. That was her decision. What a wonderful decision. How well articulated it was. What's going to be your decision this morning? What will you do with this God and this Jesus? Right. Heavenly Father, as we're here before you again this morning, we ask your blessing on the remainder of our service. We pray that you will be very, very clear to us that we always understand who you are, your character, your attributes, your promises, and then who we are in relation to you. For any who have never come to a deciding moment, and trusting you as Savior, I ask, Lord, that you will come into their hearts. I ask that you will convict them of their sin, and they will repent and become new creatures in you. What a great time of year for that to happen as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we adore you. Let us make every effort, particularly in these next 24 hours, to focus on you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Dismiss us with your blessing. Return us again, hopefully this evening, for another time of worship and glorifying your Son, whose birth is the day of tomorrow. And Lord, now as we do dismiss, ask your blessing on the time of food and fellowship. There's always something down there. We thank you for those who prepare it and lay it out for us. We ask that you are honored in our fellowship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Merry Christmas, one. Merry Christmas, all. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas.